All right, the video that you are about to see is for educational purposes only. It is basically a showing of highlight clips from a USC game involving UCLA, UC, USC, um, and the highlights are really no more than 10 minutes in length. Um, and we are just discussing what we see for educational purposes um, only. And uh, so we're invoking the fair use um, principle here when it comes to copyright. So I uh, hope you enjoy this video. And with that out of the way, welcome to the RSP Film Room. I'm Matt Waldman. This is the 30th episode. And I'm excited about this episode because a good friend of mine has um, decided that it's time for him to actually give this a whirl. Um, you know, you know him from Football Guys, and he does excellent work with really every aspect of fantasy football. But one of the, some of the things that he does that few other people do nearly as well, or anyone does as well, is when it comes to talking about injuries, and it talks to it, talk, when it comes to talking about individual defensive players for fantasy football. Um, Gene, it's I'm talking about Gene Bramble, of course. And uh, you know, before I get too wind up, wound up in this intro, let's just go ahead and bring Gene on. Welcome to the show, Gene. Thanks for coming on. No, I appreciate it. I've been looking forward to it. I hope I can live up to the rest of your guests. This has been one of my the, everything you do on your blog is awesome, but this has been one of the favorite things I've seen you do over the past couple of years, so I appreciate you having me on. Well, I appreciate it. I've been looking forward to this. I mean, De Gene goes to the Senior Bowl every year and certainly gives awesome takes about what he sees in practice when um, at the RSP blog, and he's been doing that for, I think, it's the past three or four years now. So, um, you know, when I asked Gene who he wanted to watch, he said, save me, Eric Kendricks. So John Owning is shaking his fist at you, but we had a really good, but I gave him a little bit of a consolation soliloquy on Kendricks last week as we looked at um, Owambe, um, Ode, oh, God, I, Odigi oh, uh. Zuwa. Yeah, Oa, uh oh, uh -oh. Godzilla, whatever you want to call him, you know, he's definitely, definitely great. So, Gene, tell me about Eric Kendricks and why you wanted him, you know, just for the rest of the world who hasn't been, like, all over Eric Kendricks right now. Well, I, I think the rest of the world is probably going to be turned on to Eric Kendricks soon enough. You know, we hear a little bit about Shaq Thompson. Uh, we hear about some other guys that are out there. But I think Kendricks, although we're probably not going to see too much blitz work, uh, I think as far as an all-around off-scrimmage linebacker goes, Eric Kendricks is going to be one of the best options out there. And I think he didn't do everything at the combine, but once we see a little bit more of his athleticism at his pro day, I imagine he's going to be viewed, if he's not already, as a mid-first-round pick, certainly a late-first-round pick. But I know Josh Norris, John Owning, a few other guys all see the same thing I see in Kendricks, which is a guy that it's hard to, to kind of track instincts on these cut-ups necessarily. I always kind of go back to what Bill Walsh had to say about instincts years and years and years ago, which is it's really hard to, to get a sense of instincts as you're watching video, uh, but if a guy is constantly around the ball, chances are he has it. And I think what we're going to see today with Eric Kendricks, if you watch any of the cut-ups, the one we're going to see today against USC or any of the other ones, he is constantly around the ball, and he's constantly around the ball with violence and power, which is what you want to see from a linebacker who could spend a lot of his time between the tackles. So there's lots of good things to like about Kendricks, and hopefully we'll get to see a few of them tonight. Absolutely. So if you are new to the RSP film room and haven't seen the episodes, this is not a definitive scouting report on a player. This is really just more two guys watching film and talking about what they see in that specific game. We will at times try to talk about it as if we're projecting what we see in this game as if it was common in every game so that we can give you an idea of how we might put together our view on a player after looking at several games. But again, um, you know, if we talk about something that may not be accurate when you're looking at three to four different games, understand that that's just the nature of doing a, a show like this that gives you a glimpse into the process. And hopefully you, you get a chance to learn as we learn together about what it takes to play the linebacker position, some principles about defense, um, some principles about football overall, as well as what goes on with player evaluation and our our individual takes, as well as what we've learned collectively from past, present, past and present guests and other people outside of this sphere. So um, if you're interested in participating in the RSP Film Room, 
you're more than welcome to email me and let me know. I have a I have a guest list that's running, um, you know, about five to six deep right now with players ahead of time that we've already scheduled. But I'm going to be doing this year round. So, uh, you know, I would encourage you to subscribe to the RSP Film Room. That's what it's called at YouTube, and you can be kept up to date as to when the newest videos come out each week. So, without further ado, we're going to go get ahead and get this started. We're going to watch the USC game here. I'm going to get this on the screen and make sure that we both can see it and we're good to go here. Yeah, Gene gives a thumbs up. So we're going to watch this game and it may be with this particular game what we may find with the USC game is that um, I didn't realize this but I will mention that if we have some streaming issues with the um, with the with the Pac-10 broadcasts um, we may have to go to a different game as I realized about that. So Let's see if we can get this game to actually uh, pull up in a minute, and if it doesn't, we may end up having to go to a, to a different one right away. But let's see. All right. Looks like it's going to give us a little bit of an opportunity here. trying to conspire against us, keep Eric Kendricks unknown to the world as long as possible. I think so. I think that's exactly what's happening here, is that we may end up uh, may end up having to look at something at another game. But let's, uh, let me take a look at something real quick while this is, while this is happening. Let's see. Yeah, let me try, let me try one other thing here. I didn't see one separate on YouTube today, Matt. Yeah. When I was looking, I don't think there's one on there. I think uh, I think Brian's got, and the guys have Virginia and Texas on YouTube, but I don't think they have the USC game on YouTube. Yeah, I don't I think, think they do. Too. Yeah, so I think that probably for us, for this purpose, we may have to end up doing. It looks like the Virginia game's the only one that's on YouTube at this point. Texas will be okay too. Texas. Either one of those. Yeah, Texas was on there too. Oh, it was. There we go. Okay, let's do the Texas game, because I think everyone has seen the Virginia game. Yes. So instead of rehashing that, we'll go ahead and go from here. So good call, good call. And the... All right. And if it's too jumpy, let me know. We'll go and Actually, I'm going to do this in, in halftime anyhow. I kind of like to see it from there. I do too. In fact, I almost run it frame by frame through the first couple of steps because I like to see how these guys take that first step after the snap. Well, let's do that. We'll, or we'll keep rewinding back here. Basically, what you're looking for there is to make sure that, uh, and you don't always have a good sense of exactly what keys these guys are, are keying on, um, but just get a sense of, especially against run plays, are they moving forward a little bit, you know, as they take that read step, as they take that mirror step? You don't want to see them step in the bucket. You don't want to see them take any false steps. The second and third step they take after that first step need to be pretty good. I think you're seeing that out of Kendricks here. You're also seeing him not being afraid to take on a block. You kind of run through that there. His footwork isn't great there. You'd like to see that right foot up a little bit in between the, the block a little bit and on the ground. It's a little bit easier for a lineman to turn a linebacker when you've got that foot up in the air there. But nice thing about Kendricks, and you know, I know it seems like a lot of guys have already seen the Virginia tape, and you're seeing it here too. Kendricks has the functional strength to sort of reset himself, and oftentimes he'll defeat a block that maybe he shouldn't. That's just it's not really good footwork at all there with his foot up, but you see he's still able to get off that block and make a play. So let me ask you a couple of things that you mentioned here for people who are novices with defensive play. When you talk about a read step and a bucket step, can you explain that within context of this play? So, the, again, depending on – you can read keys in a few different ways. 
a lot of times you'll have the linebackers will be reading a guard and then they'll read through the back and the ball. Sometimes the backers will just be reading the back themselves. But the first thing you want to do is just get your feet moving and what they're taught is to take a read step. So basically that's just a, to get their feet moving. And what you don't want to see is them moving backwards at all. You want to see them either stay in place or even come up a little bit. And depending on what they're reading, sometimes they'll take a mirror step, which is to, if they are reading the guard, and their guard moves in one direction or the other, that should be the direction of their first step. And that will sometimes tell you, again, oftentimes the guards in the backs are moving in the same direction, depending on if they're reading all the way through to the ball or not. But that's kind of what you're seeing him do there, is he's making a move in the same direction that the guard is making a move. And as you watch, and I've seen a few games of Kendricks a couple of different times, I think it's pretty clear to me that UCLA is taught to read the guard through to the back and then the ball. And that's kind of what you're seeing Kendricks do there. Um, in the, I think I've seen I've seen all three games that uh, that Brian's got up on draft breakdown here. I think I counted maybe three times in all of the games where Kendricks took a false step with his first step. Um, if you go actually, if you look at the Virginia game, the very first play of the Virginia game, he steps in the bucket, he takes a step back before he moves forward, um, and at no other time in either the Virginia or the Texas game will you see him do that. So, uh, and I think that just shows his comfort level whether that's film study, whether that's uh, you know just good technique, or probably a combination of both. He's generally always moving in the direction of the ball. Yeah, and that's, and a, keys. that's a great display of confidence. And it was something I noticed, too, is that he seemed very in control under his feet, um, his body under his feet. And when he took steps, they weren't large or wild steps. They were very controlled steps. Even if he stepped the wrong way in terms of reading in a direction, he didn't over have to... He didn't have to overcorrect to such a large degree to get back into position, and I really like that about him. Now, one thing that I heard tonight from from our buddy Eric Stoner, he was talking about that, you know, he played linebacker a little bit and coached linebacker a little bit and played in the Jimmy Johnson style four three defense, and he said that he was taught to read the center as opposed to the guard, and he said when he when he learned that, it opened up a full whole new dimension of football to him. Can you talk a little bit about that? Have you have you been exposed to that type of read as well and what that's the differences are? Well, I, I don't know specifically what the differences are. I think it's more difficult but more successful if you do it right, I think, from what I've read. And I didn't play the position, but from what I've read, if you are able to recognize the various types of blocking schemes and the various types of blocks you might be presented with as a linebacker, be it guard or be it center, then you can be a little bit more successful rather than reading to the back because the back, you know, the back can make a counter move. Um, you know, there's going to be lots of play action, and if you're keying on the back first, it's a little bit more simple to do because you have fewer reads. Um, but if you're reading the guard, and if you're reading, and I would assume if you're reading the center as well, um, you know, you just have a better sense of what's going to happen in that play. And we're going to see some of that with Kendricks. When I went through this Texas game, you could see him. Uh, read the guard correctly on so many occasions that even though the play looked like it might have been going in a different direction, Kendricks wasn't fooled. And as I said, you're just not going to see many false, step, false steps out of Kendricks. And it's and you know, when we talk about this in, in relation to prospects, as someone who studies a lot of running back film and a lot of running back film of NFL players too, as you're talking about reading the back, I would imagine obviously there's still advantages to that, and just because a player who is a younger player may not read it, may read a back as opposed to a guard or a center. Uh, let me tell you, Ray Lewis in the in the in the prime late years of his career, when Ladanian Tomlinson was quote unquote over the hill, I watched him read Ladanian Tomlinson on the Jets and win some and lose some making those types of reads, you know, but he definitely did that as a player. So you're talking about, you know, one of the best to ever play the game. Yeah, there's nothing wrong. I don't think there's anything wrong with reading the back necessarily. I think, you know, you set yourself up, you know, if you've got a six or seven different types of blocking schemes, if you're going to, if you make a misread there, or if you're not confident in your reads and you're not, those second and third steps are not good, then you're not going to play the linebacker position well. So I think it's a good sign that Kendrick shows that he can make that read through the triangle from the back, from the guard to the back, from the lineman to the back to the ball. Um, but it's not necessarily a bad thing if he was doing something different. Yeah, it just sounds like a fundamental, thorough type of way of doing things where you're almost like, um, if you go through that, if you go through that progression of reads, you're less likely to have a critical error. Um, you may be a little slower to the attack, but you're not going to go the wrong way as much. 
Uh, that's kind of what it sounds like to me. It's like you're taking a lot of safety steps. I mean, here, you watch him get up to the line. I mean, he's reading who he's got coming ahead here, but... I think he's probably a little bit late to recognize that pulling lineman coming along there. Yeah. Um, I think he had kind of he had dialed in so much on that read option there that he didn't notice. Got himself kind of late in good position to make a shed there, but his hands just weren't violent enough to allow him to do it. And folks, who those of you who are interested in offense, you should keep an eye on number 28, Malcolm Brown of Texas. I think he's a very underrated running back in this draft class. Um, and he's he's got that kind of quality like Arian Foster that I think that you know I don't I'm not saying he's Arian Foster but he has the type of skills that um, he may not play he may not look real fast in shorts and a t-shirt but he plays at good speed and plays with a lot of um, plays with a lot of good power and agility and vision for his own blocking scheme and could be a really good fit for a team like that as a late round pick. So here we see Kendricks over the defensive end here. Yeah, he spends a lot of his time between the tackles. You'll see him s sort of out over the tight end every now and then, but he spends most of his time in between the tackles. I think what people have noticed most about the Virginia game is how quickly Kendricks recognizes and how comfortable he is dropping into a zone. Here, you know, a lot of it's situation is third and eight, and he's not expecting a draw play here, so he knows he's got to get to. And in almost every case, you'll see them use some man coverage, but Kendricks knows where his landmarks is. He knows his job. They play a lot of too deep um, and zone coverage under. He's trying to get between the hash marks here and recognize a route. And he is not shy at all about putting his hands on a receiver if necessary. And I think what he's recognizing here is, is that there's not so much of a route going on here, that they're kind of developing a screen. And that guy's breaking down to block him rather than doing the opposite. Yeah. But what I like, too, still, when you see this type of play, as someone who's dropping back and you talk about a landmark, to me a landmark is anticipating where he thinks that route is supposed to break off. And he stops right there. That's where that turn is. Now, the you know, blocker's turning in. The guy's coming in here to block, like you said. But that's something to watch for is can they anticipate where that break point's supposed to be. It's not a bad job coming down the line, I would think. No, he's... Very, very rangy. So, you know, that guy's he's probably got a three or four yard head start on him as he comes up field. I mean, he's making a play in the air here, which is not an easy thing to do. He's got a he's got a teammate helping him from below. But this is a wrap tackle he's making off of his feet. Uh, and he's you know, this is just the first instance we'll see of him having sideline to sideline range, both in coverage and in run support here. And something that I'm impressed about when I watch tacklers the more I do so, like really study them. It's one thing to make an ankle tackle and wrap them at the below the knees. You know, you get it's easier to get a grip that way. But he's got this guy by both thighs. Yeah. I mean above the knees, that's a that's a harder grip to make because of the power that's being generated from those two pistons up high like that. He's a very fundamental tackler. You're not going to see him miss many tackles. So there you get another sense of how willing he is to step up and press the hole. So he's taking, you know, not only the first step as he's reading, but he's coming up into the hole, recognizes where this play is likely to go, and that's his gap. He'll take on that blocker there. You kind of see him roll his hips up into the blocker as well. But again, his footwork is enough that, you know, you kind of see that right foot is up in the air a little bit, even though he rolls his hips and kind of explodes up got pretty good leverage there because his base isn't great 
he's going to get driven back. So there, as he rolls his hips in, is good, but he's just getting bounced off a little bit. He doesn't have that arm free enough to make the play. But yeah. you like to see him have the willingness to get in there. A lot of guys are going to try to run around that block or take it on with their shoulder. Uh, his technique, with the exception of his footwork there, I think, is pretty good. And he still almost makes the play. Yeah. And something I like about him a lot is just the stillness overall. There's a calmness, there's a calm demeanor to his play. This may be a little too esoteric than really worthwhile analysis, but I, I like the calmness of how he plays. He's not jittery. He doesn't bounce around a lot. It's like the play starts, he starts moving. But he's not, there's not a lot of nervous energy there. Like you said early on, he's confident about what he's supposed to do. Yeah. I think it's confidence. And despite all that, you know, even though you think he looks still there, he's moved to within two yards of the line of scrimmage in those two or three considered steps. So he wants to play downhill, but he's not doing it fast. So he's playing quick in his head, but he's not playing too fast. Right. And we may get a better view of this now with this replay. Yeah, so you'll see, I mean, he's got eyes under eyes, pads under pads, but, and he's kind of rolling his hips there, but what you saw on that other view was that right foot was up in the air again, and what he wants to do is he really needs to get that right foot in between the legs of the blockers and get that firm base. And that's why size doesn't always matter. You know, we talk about undersized linebackers. Uh, we see it time and again. D'Amico Ryans was a little bit smaller. John Beeson was a little bit smaller. Certainly Levante David was a little bit smaller. But those guys all, not only do they have some speed, but they play with power. And Kendricks has been able to do that, too. And I think if he cleans his footwork up a little bit in these situations that we've seen in these first few plays here, that he's going to win these, these, uh, these, blocking, these, um, these blocks a little bit more often and get that arm free soon enough to make the play. As you said, this is a pretty good running back he's facing here. And that's why base is so important. You can have good functional strength in his hips there. But if the base isn't there, it's just too easy for him to get turned. So here's a question for you. Notice how high his strike is here. I mean, I would think this is not ideal of where you want to hit a hit a man as a defender. I would think that you'd want to hit him lower in the chest here. Is there anything from a leverage standpoint or a um, you know from a fundamental technique standpoint where this can be troublesome for a defender? Yeah, I think you know we talked talked a little bit in a, a couple of plays ago about his level of functional strength. He really should. With the base that way, he should be easily turned and pushed out of the play. And it ends up that he wasn't able to make the play because of that. But you saw as he, as he came into that block, his hands, and he was in a good spot. He had his eyes under eyes, what they teach. The eyes need to be under the eyes. The pads need to be under the pads. And you'd like him to be that hand strike to be a little bit more violent, a little bit lower into the body um, rather than up like that. But I think you, know, you saw the blocker do a good job of getting his hands inside there too. But I think, again, that has just as much to do with some of the errors he had in his base than what was going on with his upper body. Good points. Very good points. And it's funny how so often when you talk about any football player, it often begins in the hips and the legs um, and then goes to the arms. You know, you talk of like a wide receiver. Wide receiver, you know, leaps too high for the ball or leaps for a ball, and it often comes from the fact that he's not confident in his feet to keep his feet on the ground and just raise his hands. He's playing with his feet rather than playing with his eyes. You know, um, same thing with... You know, there are several other positions where that can be the case, where you're just, you're not really focusing on playing from your base. Wide receivers, sometimes you see, you see them, you know, not really learning how to release, and a lot of that has to do with steps as opposed to how they got downfield. So let's go back here to Kendricks. I think the interesting thing about this play is all of the action is away from him and he barely takes a step in the direction of the action. Now, whether this is film study or whether he's recognized something in the offensive line or sees that player coming underneath, he basically takes this play entirely away. His reaction to this underneath route takes away the short route here that's coming, and the way he's doing this, the angle he's taking to undercut this route is such that He's so in control that if you if you go frame by frame here, I bet you'll see that he stops and turns up field at the quarterback. Yeah, right there at the minute the quarterback tucks that ball, he abandons his coverage responsibility and fills downhill and makes that play behind the line of scrimmage. All right, let's let's freeze that where we see that. He takes the read step, 
Yeah, so I think he's, he's, I think he's recognizing right the route. Yeah. yeah, I think he's recognizing the route because he gives up on that play action fake a little bit soon. You wonder if you know he's just he realizes that uh, with his film study that there's a good chance that on that action you're going to see a boot and an underneath route. This is a fairly common counter off the read option for a number of teams, even in the NFL. It's pretty something something that the Shanahan's do com commonly, the Gruden's will do com commonly. This is the nice this thing about this is that just the angle he's taking to intercept this route is what blows this play up. This is a lot of the old Jerry Rice play, except they're using a tight end here. I yes. mean, this is, this is what you'd see at the goal line all the time. Charles Dimery would remember this very well in Atlanta back in the day when we were watching. Um, but what I love, too, is, you again, good players, offense and defense, are the aggressors. They are the initiators. And watch him even initiate contact. You get a little initiation of contact here so that he's posting up on this defense this receiver before he even gets a chance to turn around and make sure that he's in position. He's stacked hip to hip and then just comes through with the hit and the tackle. When you talk about tackling, forehead on the ball, he's got his weight in front of his base. That's about as good of a form tackle as you're going to get. And he doesn't give up. He wraps and brings down. And as I said, you know, instincts are all about being around the ball. And I think almost every play we've watched so far, we're probably 10 plays in here, and Kendricks has been involved in seven or eight of them, and he's been involved in a lot of them violently. Which again shows his comfort. To me, it shows his comfort and his confidence in playing. Absolutely. And this is no small quarterback. And, this court, and we're going to get another great view of this. Pretty, pretty, pretty play. Again, tackling above the knees, too. It's a big fellow to be doing that with. Mm -hmm. The kind of same thing here. I think you can kind of see him. Yeah, we'll watch this again. You know, he's 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 absolutely willing to take on a block. But again, you see him high there. His right foot is off the ground. Then he's strong enough to reestablish and kind of win the leverage battle there. But he never really gets his arm through and, and sheds that block. And then it's easy for him to get turned. So there you see him. I mean, he's kind of reestablished there after that first step. So he comes in, you know, he engages that first blocker too high. He's got that right foot off the ground. But then in the next couple of frames, there he's there he's reestablished position and he's moving forward, but he just doesn't get his hands through quick enough to to make yeah, that play. Because now his chest's exposed and bent a little bit to the inside, and that just allows 74 to drive him through. Yeah. And I, you know, I think for what it's worth, um, and Bloom will say this too, uh, I get to nitpicking these guys once they, you know, I think the first question I like to ask is. Can they play in the NFL? Can they succeed on Sundays? And if I answer that question, I think the answer is yes. And clearly with Kendricks it is. Then I really get to nitpicking. And I'm wondering, can this guy be an elite player? So we're going to nitpick technique a little bit tonight. And I don't mean to do that to say that you know Kendricks has lots of issues here that he's not going to be able to fix. Everything he's doing here, it, even despite some of these issues that he's having, he's always around the ball. Oftentimes he's making the play. Um, so it's nitpicking a little bit. So don't misunderstand me and think that I'm, you know, that I'm that I'm cracking on his technique constantly because I think these are things that can be coached and cleaned up pretty easily. And you see the functional strength, you see the athleticism and speed, you see what Bill Walsh would call instincts here. Yeah, and I think that it's a wonderful point that you bring up because again, just because you're talking lot, lots of great NFL players have they have lapses in technique or they have flaws that are that are great flaws i mean noticeable flaws that that you would not want to see but they do certain things at such a high level that are beyond category in some cases that it you know no player's perfect you know yeah. so that's the thing and and being able to talk about some of this some of the stuff won't apply too much to them it may cause them to have some bad plays or have weaknesses that that can you know that you NFL scouting reports may say he could be run at with certain types of plays. You know, yeah. get a guard on him, and he's going to have a difficult time. You know, trap plays, that kind of thing. Well, you will again. You see him. He is not shy about pressing the hole. He is not shy about taking on a block. 
we've seen and we've talked about it on the audible many linebackers you'll see try to run around the block you can run past the block but you can't run around the block if you run around the block you've been blocked yep and when you when you take on a block you basically clog up the works at the very least and here's another instance and you see how quickly he recognizes the formation understands that you know as that guy the read option fake with a little bit of boot action where that pass is likely to go between the hash marks which is his responsibility now he's got a guy coming around behind him but that's a throw that the quarterback's gonna have to make across his body he's got two other guys back there helping in that zone and he's closing while watching the quarterback's eyes another thing that's nice about how he recognizes routes is once he has a sense that he's dropped to his landmark his eyes go to the quarterback and he's recognizing the, the route runners at the same time he's watching the quarterback now this one he's he's just playing catch up a little bit but particularly in the, in the in the Virginia tape his eyes are playing the quarterback from the moment he's dropping back to his landmark yep and it's closing a, speed here too and it's a fundamentally good play in the same way that in the Virginia game you'll see him in the late second quarter or in the early third quarter cut off this kind of pass right here and take it to the house yes so it's just this one he just happens to be a little late on that step you know to be able to to be able to get there with this particular receiver yeah I think he lost his footing just a hair as he was trying to get to the back of his drop there yeah he did you saw him kind of rock back a little bit with that step we'll look at it right here Let's see. Here we go. A little bit of a... Yeah. And then that next step right after that. But the closing speed is there. It sure is. And that's and that's why this is a game of inches. I mean, that one little flub right there basically costs a pass defense. Or more, yeah. Or more. And instead it's almost a first down, maybe even is a first down if I recall this this play. Yep, first down. There was a little bit of a false step on that one. Yeah. But here he comes back <laughs> yeah. into the play. But, uh, you know, despite all that, <laughs> he just closed 10 yards there and brought the quarterback down at the line of scrimmage. Yeah. That's an amazing play, really. So he's kind of, he gets a little bit lost on that read option play fake there takes a couple of extra steps sort of sees what's going on he's, he's, he's recognizing that that running back coming out of the backfield after the fake is his threat but the quarterback's already kind of given up and he's in the frame immediately again yeah. with a you good strong even, final yeah, attack. You can see his shadow right here coming <laughs> through there you go right after that and, you know, just this closing part right here I find interesting because, you know, you have to anticipate a guy making a move and you don't want to bite too hard on anything. I think he's already in this quarterback's head. There yeah. wasn't any move. He was already kind of, I feel like Swoops was yeah. setting himself up for the hit already. Really nice play. Nice angle there too. Cleans up yeah, the plate. I think so. Here. I think you know somebody might. I think there's. You might have an argument whether he's running around or running through that block. I would say this is more running through the block. He's trying to take the quickest angle to the ball. Yeah. Doesn't really do him any good there to try to blow up that block or being that far away from the play. Yeah, I would totally disagree with someone if they said they were that he was running around it because, really, where he's diagnosing this play and where you would you would expect a player to diagnose this play is right yeah. about here. Yeah. I mean, even before that. And if it was like, let's see if I can clip it. About right here, he sees this guy coming down the hill. He hasn't even turned yet. And he's and you see um, Kendrick's really starting to drive at this point. And he's planting off that step to turn. And then you see the lineman turn into him. Yeah, I agree. I think that's almost 
you call that running back vision, I guess. You know, that's open field running for a linebacker. Yeah. And he sifted through traffic very well on that play, in my opinion. And again, opinion. he's the one making the play. Yeah. No touch drill success for that back or ball carrier after that. So that's good. So here's another sense. You see him, you could just see before he runs out of frame that his eyes are on the quarterback as he's going back toward his landmark. He doesn't have to turn and make sure that he's in the right place on the field. He knows where he is. He knows where his responsibility is. Again, he's the one that's on the ball here. That's technically out of his underneath zone, but he's the one making the play. Yeah. That just looks like a blown deal. We'll skip over that one. Yeah. It's one of the few times you'll see him get beat on play action, but he's kind of selling out to stop the run there. That's one of the few times that Texas is not showing a read option there. That may have been what got him. Yeah. Almost every... Run pass. play they've had or pass has been a read option play fake or a straight read option. So you can see why that may have looked to him differently. So let me ask you just outside of this play, do you see him as purely a 4-3 linebacker or does he have a potential to play in a 3-4 in a and, and why would he if he, if he I does? I don't think there's any difference between – a 4-3 middle linebacker and a 3-4 inside linebacker in most of today's 3-4 schemes. I guess the question is, you know, is there a team, is there a 3-4 team out there that would ask both its linebackers to do so much 3-4 inside linebacker, or two-gap is an inside linebacker that, you know, maybe you don't want him doing that. But, you know, 15, 20 years ago, there was a big difference between particularly a 3-4 strong inside linebacker two-gapping and a 4-3 middle linebacker that'd be playing in a Jimmy Johnson, you know, almost a, a read on the run type of four three front. I think I think you can see Kendricks playing, you know, I don't think his best fit would be as a four three strong side linebacker, but I think any of the four three positions Kendricks would be appropriate for. And I think either three four inside position would be okay. And I think, you know, again, you see him play with power. You see him willing to play the run between the tackles. And that's really the job of of most of the off the scrimmage linebackers right now in either the 4-3 or the 3-4. They're one gapping. You know, their job is to play the run. Uh, and I think, you know, a lot of schemes, you know, at least as we're talking in the base defense, um, ask you to do that too. The other nice thing about a player like Kendricks and the reason that he's he's going to get a first round grade from a lot of teams is, you know, we talk in the same way that running back position has been marginalized a little bit. The linebacker position hasn't really been a priority for a lot of teams because they end up platooning so much. However, if you can find a player that can play the run between the tackles and cover, then you've got a player that can play on any down for you, and you can play your nickel defense and not feel like you've got a linebacker between the tackles that's going to get killed against the run. Um, you know, you see quarterback after quarterback you know, bring that 11 personnel up to the line, get the nickel defense on the field, see if they've got six in the box and run at these guys. Well, I don't think you're going to be able to do that against Kendricks depending on, you know, the players he's got around him. But I don't see Kendricks as a liability in that situation. And that's a valued commodity, a guy that can, that can recognize the run, play the run, and play in coverage in both of those situations, either a base defense or, you know, in a six-man front alignment is a, a very valuable piece to have because of all the flexibility it gives you against some of these offenses. Absolutely, and that's a that's a wonderful point that really projects well to what goes on in the NFL. 
again, you're just looking at range here. I mean, he's making it from the middle of the field all the way outside the numbers, impacting a play here. Nice stop there, too. Yeah. You see the same things against, you know, even though a lot of this is read option, and it may give him an extra beat rather than those, you know, the isolation runs and the wedges and the dives and that sort of stuff. You see him press the hole immediately. He's taking those read steps, but he's still coming downhill. The other nice thing about that is he's not, in most cases, he doesn't get so close to the line of scrimmage as he's pressing that he's getting caught up in the trash. Yeah. He's pressing the correct hole when he's making a play. And that's what I like about the controlled steps most of the time is that he, you know, it's like a quarterback moving in the pocket. He doesn't overreact to what's going on. He just moves enough so that he can, that he can set up his next decision. Yeah, and you can talk about the power of Mr. Brown here against Kendricks. I think, you know, this is a, a situation where Kendricks looked like he was in pretty good position, wrapped him a little high. But that may yeah. be more of a play from the the running back than it is. Yeah, this was a five star running back, folks, out of out of high school. Now, five stars usually means for skeptical scouts, um, overprivileged, um, entitled football players, and that's kind of the joke sometimes that who never make it to the NFL. But that's not really always the case. Um, Malcolm Brown obviously has been in a regime in Texas coming out of Mac Brown's regime where things had soured. Um, so maybe, you know, people say he never really progressed. But you can see the tools here. And you can see as Kendricks gets up, he ain't happy. No. <laughs> no linebacker likes to lose a battle like that. And that's that'll pump a running back up big time right there, too. It's like the sheepdog and the uh, and the wolf. And that's a nice play. Because yeah. I mean, look at you know, you look at Kendricks, and he's already down for the count here with a with a cut, and recovers very fast, even from his knees, makes the play. Yeah. So that's that's a much better shed from him. The footwork, the base is better. It's the reason he gets cut is because his first play against that block was so good. But he's not giving up, staying on his feet, good balance. Yeah, and and you gotta when people talk about always maintain that downhill mentality, this is why in some regards to be stay fundamentally sound. When you're fundamentally sound, even when you lose at that section, he falls in a way that is just like a drill almost. He falls down, he's on all fours, gets is able to get back up quickly and impact the play. Yeah, he's not panicking. Again, he's comfortable in his cleats there. He's not panicking, stumbling, trying to make a play. He gives himself the best chance to get up and stay in position to make that play. Again, against a running back that just ran him over. Yeah, exactly. Eyes up. <laughs> yeah. He yeah. gets himself in position, gets his head forward, puts his helmet on the ball, gets help. Yeah. But he's the one that made that play. Yeah. Again, almost every play we're watching here, Kendricks is around the ball. So. And we cannot emphasize that enough, how rare that really is. I mean, we're talking ho-hum like we're watching a running back who's getting the ball 20 times in a game. Yeah. We're talking about a linebacker who's impacting nearly every play in the game. More range, showing the ability, easy control of that blocker. You know, a lot of guys in the NFL against some of the bigger players, and, you know, Kendricks may have this issue in the NFL, but, you know, that, that uh, I don't know, it was a 25-yard line. The yard line there is, you know, that last play is easy to see him. He's not getting pushed back. He's running right along that 35-yard line there rather than having that tight end push him toward the 40. Yeah. You know, his pursuit angle here is good. He is not getting blown off. He is continuing 
on a good angle toward the ball. He's not getting pushed off at a 45 degree angle there. So again, just good functional strength he's got. Yeah. And it's good use of the hands too. I mean, I like the, again, that hand work helps because he, he gets the hand into the chest. He works it in there, continues to push in with it and turning. Mm -hmm. And it's about the hips because at this point he doesn't, he doesn't get his hips turned downfield in terms of north south. He keeps him turned east west so he can just use the the north south arm to help him drive and slip right past. He slips right under it that way. He does get a little high, but yes. you know, this is the fourth or fifth time we've said this. He is able to reestablish his leverage quickly because he's got the strength to overcome. Now, how often is he going to be able to do that? against bigger, more athletic players in the NFL? I don't know, but that's more of a technique issue than it is a functional strength and athleticism issue. Yeah, that's going to be something that he's going to have to work on on his own to get lower, and he'll probably, it's probably one of those things that it's like, okay, I'm going to have to be more conscious about doing this, and it might take him a year to really get sound at that. All right, now there's a situation where you would have liked to have seen him not take that third and fourth step up press into that hole because he gets caught up and again he's high and he can't get his arm free to make that tackle. You can see he wants to make a play. Yeah. And he's violent and he strikes back, he rolls his hips in there. But maybe he makes that play with a little bit more violence if he's not as close to the line of scrimmage. Like he waits here, waits for this this wind back to come in from the tight end and then burst up knock yeah, the guy right. off and that may be or... why it may be that it was you know that he was pressing the hole in that in the uh, in the yeah, pulling block got him but I'd be interested to see if somebody you know what Ryan might say about that or or even Eric somebody that's got some experience playing linebacker if that's a situation where you know you'd like him to continue to press the hole and, and maybe just have a little bit better and quicker technique at the point of attack there or if that's a situation where you know maybe you don't take that final step toward the line yeah that's a great question. It would be a good one for, to hear from them. And then I also just wonder, did he read Did he read the wine back? You know, is he cueing the back on this particular play? And then when he gets up here, yeah. it's, you know, but it seems like he's prepared for that linebacker the way that he hit him. So I don't think it's that he didn't see the, he didn't see the lead block. Yeah, really nice hand work. He just, I mean, again. He's controlled, very, but downhill. Yeah, very rarely loses his grip on a player, too. And trust me, when, when I talk about Malcolm Brown and why I think he's underrated, and I'm not talking he's the best thing you've ever seen at running back that no one's talking about. I'm just saying he's a good he's a good quality NFL prospect that is, you know, in a really good class. I've seen Malcolm Brown bounce off hits from defensive line, defensive linemen um, in the SEC, um, guys who are going to be playing in the NFL from like Ole Miss, and and do it in a way that is in pretty impressive fashion. So when you have a guy like Kendricks who's wrapping you up, and it's just like he gets his hand on you and it's over, that that's a nice that's a nice um, testament to what Kendricks can do as a tackler. Yeah, not a lot Kendricks is going to be able to do about that one. Teammates are kind of peeking in the backfield there. Yeah, right here. <laughs> yeah, and they definitely, you know, they got a seal on the end there for sure. Yeah. There wasn't a lot that was going to go right on that play. And they and they also crossed them up a little bit because that play where he did stop the running back or gets kind of get pushed back was a wind back just like this. So they use that same windback type of um, setup here to run the back in a different direction. So instead of it going up the middle and being a windback here, because mm -hmm. of what happens up front, it ends up outside, and Kendricks was covering his responsibility there. And it was Jack who overran the play. Who 
who will we I am sure we will be watching in the next year or two. <laughs> Old Miles Jack, who I keep wanting to call the Georgia Tech former Georgia Tech guard. I have this thing with Georgia Tech guards and football players. I keep misnaming them. Range, range, more yeah. range. This may be our last play here. Yep. So that's our man. Yeah, it'd be interesting to go back and, and sort of chart to see how many plays he was in on, mark down where on the field he made those plays. I think you're seeing him make plays inside and outside the hash marks. Yeah. So let me ask you this. You were talking about the different linebacker positions, and I've, I've read, you know, I think it was owning, and I've seen on Twitter a number of other people talk about him as being a will linebacker. What, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I think that's fine. Um, I, I, don't, I don't really get picky. I think, you know, if you want to talk about a Telvin Smith – or maybe a Shaq Thompson, um, a player that, you know, we're talking degrees here, and yes, Levante David and some of those other guys are going to function well with power, but at some point, you're going to have to have, you're going to have to have enough functional strength, enough weight to be able to play between the tackles consistently. But I don't, I didn't see anything there, and I didn't see anything against Virginia or USC that makes me think you need to put Kendricks in a protected position. Now, could he do a little bit better if you had, you know, a David Harris, a, a Ray Maluga, a, a between the tackles guy that would take the blocks on behind a good offensive, good behind a good defensive line that would keep Kendricks protected and not have to face any blocks at all and allow him to use his instincts and speed to make plays around the line of scrimmage? Sure. I think, you know, would that be his best fit? Possibly. But I'm not seeing anything that, from him that makes me think, with a little bit of cleaning that technique up some, that he wouldn't be successful as an interior linebacker, be it a 4-3 Mike or either a 3-4 inside linebacker position. And I think some of the things that Kendrick showed, we saw from, I feel like we saw from Navarro Bowman years ago, if you go back and look at his tape, um, give him a year of uh, coaching under Vic Fangio and a year in the weight room, and Bowman was a totally different player, I thought, more powerful, more physical. All of the instincts and speed that he had were still there, but he was much more of an interior linebacker than I felt like he looked, um, you know, on his college tape. And I think you could say the same thing for Kendricks. His brother kind of looked the same way. If you watched Michael Kendricks at Cal, you saw the same violence. You saw the same downhill play. Um, I think his, Michael was a little bit more, I wouldn't say out of control, uh, but he wasn't as gathered as Eric is. Uh, and I think they compare pretty favorably, and I think Michael Kendricks has grown into a pretty good in-between-the-tackles linebacker as a 3-4 guy. So I don't think there's a whole lot of difference between those players. If you want to make him a 4-3 will, he can certainly succeed there, and he may end up making, you know, is he going to make a Levante David impact as a 4-3 will? I don't know the answer to that question necessarily. Um, but I, I, I don't think I would pigeonhole him in that role. I don't cool. know that John was doing that either. but no, I don't think so either. But let me ask you two quick – we're going to do two lightning round questions here, as, as our buddy Bloom would say. So the two final lightning round questions are this. First, for all our IDP listeners out there who are tuning in to, to listen to Gene Bramble, because I know a lot of you guys are going to be out there to do that because we have a, a very strong and loyal contention of IDP people. So where, you know, if, he, if he goes as a middle linebacker um, – where would you draft him in a rookie dynasty league? Is he a top five pick? Yeah, I think if he goes to a right situation, um, he's showing everything that you know he's going to be on the field every down. You know he can play the run, and he's clearly successful in the coverage. The only thing we're really not seeing here is whether or not he can be successful uh, as a blitzer if he's got any upside uh, as a sacker as far as you know statistical value goes there. But, yeah, I think you know so much depends on situations for fantasy purposes. But, I, you know... Just looking at guys like Ben Ardrick McKinney, Shaq Thompson, you know, even Paul Dawson at this point, Denzel Perriman, those are the guys that Kendricks is going to likely be compared to in terms of first, second, third round talents that might be every down players. Um, I like Kendricks more than anybody else on that list. 
I agree with you completely, and I've seen those guys. So give me one, one more question for you is where would you like to see him go where he could maximize his talents? Well, there was a lot of talk after A.J. Hawk was released yesterday that people were hoping that Kendricks would fall to the Packers. Um, I think putting him in a Dom, Dom Capers-like scheme where he would be using a few different types of nickel packages, I think he'd be very successful there. But there's lots of teams. You know, the, If you're looking for a 4-3 team, um, I would, I would love to see right. – I mean, I would love to see the Giants finally draft a running back – or a uh, running back, a linebacker to play between the tackles. I mean, not that Jamil McLean and, you know, they've got Devin, uh, Devin Kennard there as well. But uh, I, honestly, I think – if a team identifies Kendricks, the same as they as the Ravens did C.J. Mosley last year, you know, you think you have Daryl Smith and Arthur Brown there prepared to play the inside linebacker position. If a team identifies Kendricks as the Ravens did Mosley as a player that's just too high on their board to pass up, wherever Kendricks goes, I think he's going to be a productive player. Excellent. Well, Gene, thanks again for doing this show with us. I know that um, everyone's going to get a chance to enjoy this. It was terrific analysis. And uh, for Gene Brammel, I'm Matt Waldman. Once again, this is the RSP Film Room, and you guys have a good weekend.